Okay, thanks all for being here and getting some energy to start the day. I um, woke up in beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts this morning. Uh, I rode a bike across Cambridge at 4 a.m. to make the first to sell of the day, get down here, and I'm very excited. Uh, so the, the talk today is on Jacks for Bays. Um, I'm gonna be talking a little bit uh, about doing Bayesian analysis, Bayesian probability um, uh, in Jacks, and, and generally giving an outline of what the, the whole ecosystem looks like. Um, I don't know, has anyone heard the term forest bath? I don't know if this is just like an our family thing. Like you go out to the forest and you, you're just there being in nature and you're enjoying it, and getting a feel for things. Um, so today is gonna be like a code bath. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of code that goes on here and I don't want you to worry about understanding it all. Um, it all morally runs. It doesn't actually run. Uh, but there is a, a, a company in CoLab that I got all this code from that actually runs. Um, so I'm not lying to you when I put code snippets up. Um, I'm, not, I'm not really lying to you. Sometimes I'm a little bit lying to you. Uh, so the, the agenda for the day is first to talk about the Bayesian workflow. Um, this is based on uh, a paper a lot of the, the stand developers, also a IData supported uh, project. Uh, a paper some of the stand developers um, been working on sort of a project that they've been uh, doing a lot of really interesting discussions around. Um, and then second, I want to talk about how uh, how the JAX ecosystem can feed into the Bayesian workflow. Um, and and hopefully, hopefully you all will take away from this talk either a, a structured way to think about a Bayesian and or some useful libraries to try out in the future and some, some ways to think about how uh, uh, how the open source world might uh, might approach Bayesian computation in the future. So that's a lot of big words. Um, that's a very high look. Like I said, there's gonna be a lot of, a lot of code going on. Um, so first of all, the, this is the Bayesian workflow from this uh, Gelman et al. paper. Um, I encourage you to go look for, uh, for the paper. You can just Google Bayesian workflow Gelman. Um, I, I, the word is that they will not be able to get this published, but they might just turn into a book um, because it's, uh, it's Wonderful things. Um, so I, I sort of recreated the uh, the workflow that they have up here, and I thought a good way. You know, th these are a lot of steps. There's a lot of places to go, and I thought a good way is just to work through a case study, and we'll just highlight what steps we're at um, for for each of these. Uh, the case study I'm going to work through is a uh, golfing one. Um, possibly people know about golfing. Uh, you're you're hitting a tiny ball around a big green space that might be better served as forest. Um, and eventually you get it onto a even finer mode section called the green, and you try to put it in with a much smaller club than you had been using the rest of the day. Um, so this is a very small data set. Um, it's got distance, which I think is in feet. It's got the number of observations we have of people trying to putt from that distance, uh, and then a number of successes. Uh, it might be easier just to visualize it. Uh, and so you can see like from, from Two feet away, people usually make the putt. Um, these are, I believe, professional golfers, um, so they're better than perhaps you or I. Um, and from like 20 feet away, it's, it's much rarer to make a putt um, from there. And, and maybe we're given this uh, data set and we want to build a model. So how do we do that? We might um, turn to our Bayesian, uh, Bayesian library. So I'm, I'm using TensorFlow Probability. Um, that's a library that I do help develop. It's called TensorFlow Probability. We've talked about uh, trying to rebrand as TensorFriendly Probability because it actually works on JAX. Um, so if you use this import statement, uh, tensorflowprobability.substrates.jax, um, you get a version that's, uh, that everything is written in JAX. Um, JAX tools work nicely with. Um, and this is how you write a model in TensorFlow Probability. A lot of probabilistic programming languages look fairly similar to this. I'll show a bunch of other languages later. Um, but the things I want to highlight is that your random variables can be used just like your normal programming variables. Um, so we define this slope here as being a normal, normally distributed random variable, um, same as intercept, and then later on we can plug those in and use them, multiply them by other uh, numbers. Uh, the model we're doing here, for those of you, who's, uh, who's like used a probabilistic programming language before? Can we get, perfect. Perfect, so for those of you who have not used a program, probabilistic programming language before, you might be looking and wondering, for example, why am I choosing like these distributions, normals and binomials? Uh, the easy answer is that normal's a safe choice. If you have nothing better to do, you might choose a normal. Um, binomial just turns out to be the right choice for a problem like this. A binomial distribution describes 
how many successes you'll get in total count tries given, well, this is the logit of a probability, but given some probability of success, some number of tries, the distribution of successes is given by a binomial distribution. So this just turns out to be like, you know, we give, we give special names to special distributions. And this is the special distribution for, for situations like this. And so what we're trying to do with this model essentially is fit, uh, fit a line, you know, slope and intercept, slope times the distance plus some intercept. Um, it, we'll call it a two-parameter uh, model because we want to learn about the slope and the intercept. The successes we'll actually condition on. We'll say, hey, we actually saw this number of successes. Um, but we'll do that later. So this is initializing the model. So I wrote down the model. And you'll also see that there's a decorator up there. Um, I feel like every Python conference has a little talk about decorators. They're hard to get your mind around, but they eat functions and give you back new functions. Uh, and the thing that this gives you back is actually a class, uh, and it has two methods that are important to us today. One is called sample, and one is called log probability. And so you can take this regression model object and call sample on it, and it'll give you samples from these parameters. You can also <laughs> pass values for those parameters back in, and it'll compute the log probability of those. Um, the other thing I should say is the reason it's a log probability and not a probability is because probabilities get very, very tiny. Um, so log probabilities are, are better for computers to use. How are we feeling so far? Great. Good. Don't, don't have to understand everything. You know, we're letting it wash over us. We'll see a lot of code. Uh, so we've done, we've initialized a model. We got a prior predictive check now. Um, and we can use our model to help out with our prior predictive check. A prior predictive check is, let's just make sure our priors are reasonable. Um, so for those of us who haven't done Bayesian modeling or those who have, um, sometimes it's hard to know what model you just wrote down and it's useful to sample from your model. Um, so I'm calling dot sample, I'm computing the probability something goes in by, uh, you see that those draws have a dot slope and a dot intercept method. Um, so I can just pass those into uh, a logit, which is confusingly xbit over here. Um, and then I get a probability that everything goes in. Sorry, xbit is the inverse of the logit. Good. Terrible that this is recorded. Everyone will know now. Um, so what do I get? I get all these lines. Um, so this was 100 draws from the prior. Um, the prior knows nothing about our actual data. I've plotted our data here just for interest's sake. Um, but here are 100 places where a model thinks are, are reasonable for uh, uh, to predict at the end of the day. I highlighted one in orange because that looked the most reasonable to me. It took me a while to find it. Um, and if I was like being really careful, I might look at this and say, hey, there are a bunch of lines with a positive slope. I like actually think that that's really unlikely that golfers get better at putting as they get farther away from the hole. So maybe I could pick a better prior for the, the slope that, uh, that penalizes having a, uh, penalizes getting better when you get farther away. Um, but it turns out that, this, uh, that, that those disappear really quickly once you condition. So this is our prior predictive check. Uh, we can move around to fitting the model. Um, if you see me in the hallway afterwards, this is where, uh, this is where my happy place is. Uh, I'm not going to focus on what's actually going on here today. Um, this is why we are using JAX uh, or some sort of uh, auto differentiation library. So a, a library that knows how to compute uh, derivatives. Uh, because you can do a much better job of fitting a model once you have derivatives. Um, TFP ships with a function called windowed adaptive nuts that runs um, a wonderful gradient-based sampler. Um, and it'll do a good job drawing samples from your model. Uh, I should notice, note that right here is when we first introduce our, we, we actually condition right here. So we condition and say the number of successes we had was actually the number of successes from the data. Can you tell us what JAX is? Boy, great question. <laughs> Uh, JAX is a, uh, you should think of JAX as like uh, NumPy, but it works on accelerators and it has gradients. Um, so if you have a GPU um, and you want to compute gradients, you can mostly convert all your uh, code instantly to JAX. <sighs> Could have used a slide or two on that. Um, as a follow-up, can you compare JAX to PyTorch? I know the component of PyTorch that gives you that which you just described, tensor computation, and I'm one of the few people who haven't used PyTorch. So, so all I can say is, is, is that I know many very happy PyTorch users and very happy JAX users. I just mean conceptually, like are they similar yes. tools that, that do similar things? Yes. Like that component of PyTorch that gives you gradients and gives you tensor computation and so on. Yeah, yeah. So I think my, my general view, and this is 
speaking as a PyTorch note, novice, is that uh, I would think of these as lighter weight frameworks than, say, TensorFlow, um, but both of them feel a lot like you're using NumPy, um, plus you have these extra functions that give you, uh, uh, that give you these things like gradients or, uh, or vectorizing your computation. Please. That's also a great question. Um, so, so uh, the the question asked was, why are we using, why are we going right to Bayesian models here? Um, I'm going to assume that we care um, deeply in this case about uh, the uncertainty around our estimates as well. Um, and it turns out with some of these. Uh, with at least this first model, you could compute that by hand um, if you do enough math. Um, but we're about to move to a second model where you wouldn't be able to, to get the uncertainty on your estimates. Um, this, this case study um, was originally, I think, from Andrew Gelman. I have ported it to PyMC and TensorFlow Probability. And one of the things I did with the uncertainty was um, eventually you can get, like, how many putts will it take if you start from 20 feet away? Because um, you'll actually get estimates on how far away you'll be after one putt and two putts and so on. And so you can like play things forward, uh, which would be very hard to do with a, uh, with a curve fit. Any other? These are wonderful questions. Perfect. So we fit a model. Uh, we move around to validating our computation. Um, here I'm passing off to this library called RVs. Uh, RVs is a library designed to validate and, uh, and plot computations from Bayesian libraries. Uh, and one thing it gives you is summary. And I just want to tell you how to read this summary because it, it looks a little intimidating. Um, the first number I look at is this r hat column. Um, r hat uh, should be around 1. If it's bigger than like 1.05, you, you might have had some problems uh, and you, you might want to go back and look. Um, all of these are necessary but not sufficient. So if R hat is one, it means you might have done a good job fitting. It doesn't tell you you definitely did. But if R hat is big, it says you did, did not do a good job fitting. Uh, the other number to look at is this uh, effective sample size, ESS. Um, so ESS bulk uh, gives you, well, let's step back. MCMC gives you uh, correlated samples. So each draw will be correlated with the draw before it. Um, correlated samples are not as good at computing, like say, uncertainty as independent samples. And ESS you can think of as the number of independent samples that you got. Um, so in this model, I actually I ended up drawing 4,000, getting 4,000 points, but that's only worth 2,200 uh, independent draws. So that's how you might think about this ESS. Um, and that's really helpful if you are computing uncertainty and if you want to know like something about your tails, um, how well you can uh, control the standard deviation on your estimate. But like really, if you're if you're doing this, usually like 100 is probably good enough. Uh, you know, your your error goes down as the square root of the number of independent draws you have. So 2,200 is, is quite good, um, and I probably won't notice that I did not have independent draws. Great. Now we can evaluate and use our model. Um, so this is this is sort of the curve fitting, and and we did a lot more. We we burned a lot more CPU time than we would have if we had just optimized for this curve. Um, but you can actually see there are 100 curves drawn here. The one in bold orange is the mean of all my draws, but all the, the little shaded ones that you can barely see are all the other places where uh, the mean probability of going in are plotted. Um, so this did an okay job. It, it didn't fit well here. It, it, it kind of misses this. Um, uh, the other thing that's funny and the other way you might evaluate this model is you can just plug in points. Um, so right here I'm calculating what's the chance of making a putt from 50 feet away. Uh, and I think, I think e to the minus 5 is like out of 10,000. So it's, it's like 2.7 out of 10,000 times. It might be 27 out of 10,000. Um, division is very hard. Um, so that, that seems like a pretty low chance. Uh, you might not know much about golf. We can really quickly check with a Google search how often people make a 50-foot putt. Uh, and it looks like it's not like 2 out of 10,000 rare. Um, so maybe this model is a little bit like underconfident in the ability of professional golfers, especially outside of the this, uh, place where we trained it. Right. I think we all know uh, it's, it's common to know that you, you might not want to run your model at well outside of where your training data was. That's what I'm doing here. You know, 20 feet was the longest putt in the training data, and I'm asking it about 50 feet. So like, maybe it's reasonable that it's making uh, wild assumptions about that. But um, 
But this is how we evaluate our model. If this is what we cared about, we might want to go back and modify our model. Um, so uh, if you get bored, probability that goes in is a really fun geometry problem that you can work on for the rest of the talk. Um, and so the way we're going to think about this is when you want to make a putt, you're standing, say, 10 feet away, you're putting a ball, uh, and, and you know which direction to aim in. And maybe you, you can't hit it exactly in the right direction, right? So you might be off by a couple percents of a radian. Um, and if you're off by too many percents of a radian, it'll miss. Um, so that's going to be our new model. Uh, and you can write the probability that goes in given the error in your aiming and given how far away you are. Um, distances here is, is plural because I'm expecting a vector to come in. Um, but once we have that function, we can go and plug that back into a probabilistic model. Um, we now have just a one, uh, did I highlight this? Yeah, now we just have a one parameter model, but then I'm adding a deterministic node here. So that's the probability that goes in, and I'm passing in our angle error to that along with the actual distances from our data set. Um, and what we're going to get is, again, a binomial uh, distribution, but now I'm passing in the probabilities instead of the logits um, that I did last time. So we modified our model. Um, I'm going to do a more interesting uh, prior predictive check this time, uh, where I sample from the prior and I see where the prior suggests um, we, we actually put in the ball. So green is where we start, red is where we're aiming, and uh, our prior says that maybe a professional golfer, when they're starting here, sometimes hits it over here. That's not that reasonable. Some other things that are weird about this is that if, if they're off by a big enough angle, they might go all the way around to here which puts like a little too much density here compared to what I wanted because you can get there in two different ways. You can miss to the left or way to the right. Um, so there's, there's some funny things about this prior, but it turns out that professional golfers don't actually hit it this way that often. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, you can fit the model again. You can go back and compute your, uh, your R hat again. Um, so the R hat is really good. The, the effective sample size is even higher. Um, so I got even more. Uh, effective independent samples. Um, another diagnostic you might run is a trace plot. Uh, the trace plot on the left, this gives you a histogram, a density plot of your draws for that parameter. And on the right, it's sort of a time series of those draws. Um, I've showed this because this is just like a really pretty uh, like set of histograms. Uh, so if you, if you sort of think about what's going on here, um, this blue one is the chance of making it from two feet away um, along with uh, our error on that estimate. Um, this is from three feet, four feet, five feet, and so on. So it's, uh, you move sort of from the right to the left because there's high probability and lower probability. Uh, the black tick marks on the bottom are where uh, MCMC encountered this technical problem with uh, its numerical integration. Um, seeing those does mean that you, you ought to uh, mess with your uh, uh, sampling method a little bit or mess with your model a little bit to make it easier to sample from. Um, so so those, those should make us worried despite seeing a really good R hat and a really good uh, number of effective samples. Um, and this is why we check all of our diagnostics. Um, but here's another diagnostic. Um, and we can keep on going like this. Um, so, so one thing about our previous model was that we assumed that the professional golfers might not be able to aim the ball in the correct direction, but they would hit it the exact right distance every time. Um, so one other way to change it is to say, hey, they, they hit it about the right distance, but there's some normal error on how far they hit it. So if we again draw from our prior predictive check, um, we'll, we'll get this. Um, we could keep going around, fitting the model. Um, this is actually the model that, uh, the, in the case study that, that Gelman wrote, uh, he ends up on. And so you can see this one and, and the results. They fit this, uh, this data set as well as a bigger, more modern data set quite well. Great, so any questions on sort of the Bayesian workflow that we just went over. I'm now going to go start talking about actual libraries and, and uh, places that aren't that model. Is there a value in narrowing the prior down to sort of in the direction of the cup as opposed to nobody seeing the backwards? Yeah, so, so uh, the, the question was, is there value in narrowing the, the, uh, the probability? Um, you can get into like these huge arguments about how much priors are putting a finger on the scale versus not. I think, um, I think most successful and pragmatic Bayesian practitioners try to use a weakly informative prior. Um, so I think it wouldn't, uh, I would not raise an eye if you were putting very little probability on it going behind you. I would raise an eye if you said that there was zero probability of hitting it back there. Um, but if there was like exponentially little probability, then that's, that's fine. 
because um, because you it, it would need to be extraordinary evidence to convince you that sometimes professional putters like hit it, hit it behind them when they intend to hit it forward. Um, but yeah, uh, the other case in which you might need to do that is if you do see integration errors like that. Sometimes the model uh, those come from curvature in the posterior, and sometimes that curvature gets smoothed out if you have a little bit more constraining of priors. Um, so there can also be technical reasons to do that, um, and then you can argue over whether you should actually be changing your model because your sampler is not good enough. <laughs> yeah, like, like I said, I'm, I'm uh, perhaps too enthusiastic about the sampling part of this. Uh, cool, any other questions about the sort of the case study and stepping through the workflow? Yeah, so that, uh, the, how I explain these? Yeah, so, so the algorithm that we're using um, is an MCMC algorithm. MCMC proposes a new spot, and if it's at a high, spot of higher probability, it'll always accept. And if it's lower probability, it'll sometimes accept with the right ratio, and then it, because of math, it works out. These gradient-based samplers, um, they actually do this numerical integration uh, internally, and if the integration was done perfectly, you would always accept. The integration isn't always done perfectly, and, and the worse you do it, the faster you'll go. So we try to do it as bad as possible without wasting computation. And so sometimes uh, you break the integrator and it, it runs off towards infinity. Um, and one way that happens is just you're a little bit greedy. Another way that happens is that there's a region of high curvature that you can never get to with your integrator. And so the fact that you could never get there means that you'll never explore part of your posterior and you, you no longer have, uh, a, you will no longer compute good expectations. That's, I don't know, like half a semester of uh, <laughs> like Bayesian computation. Any other? Again, thanks so much for all the questions. This is uh, very good. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, an ecosystem for probabilistic programming. Um, I've got a bunch of uh, logos down here, um, including the new PyMC logo that does not include a three on it. Uh, this is, uh, this is Exoplanet. Um, so Dan Foreman Mackey is an astronomer down at the Flatiron Institute. Um, MC, I believe, has the most citations of any of these. I think it even beats Stan. Um, and I'll, I'll show some things about that. It doesn't beat TensorFlow itself, but it does beat TensorFlow probability. Um, but Exoplanet is a newer, uh, newer version of this MC uh, library. Um, and any, you know, as, as with the keynote, anything we can do in open source to help the astrophysicists we will do because it's so cool. Okay, so th this talk was, was largely uh, uh, inspired by a blog post I wrote uh, four or five years ago um, that implemented this linear model in five different probabilistic programming languages. Um, so I generate some data here using NumPy. Um, anything with an underscore after it is hidden. Um, and so I, I just wrote down models that try to infer what the uh, weights are and what the noise is. Um, and here's just our simulated data. Um, and in, in many ways, this is a, uh, I, I sort of want to go through some of those implementations and show you what sort of the state of play was five years ago and compare that to what the state of play is today. Um, so this is Stan. Um, Stan is its own programming language. Um, it started with uh, Andrew Gelman's group over in Columbia. Um, it's uh, NumFoc is supported. It's fantastic. I won't say anything bad about Stan ever. Um, everyone tries to be like Stan. Um, we should all try to be like Stan. Uh, so this is, this is what the, the model looks like in Stan. If you're using R or Python, there are good bindings um, to use there. Command Stan is great. Um, and, and this will run really fast. Um, this is not using JAX. This is using its own autodiff. Um, uh, this was PyMC3. Um, this will actually also run on PyMC version 4. Uh, this, is a, this is a library that I've helped contribute to quite a bit. Um, I, I like how expressive it is. It's, it's Python native. It used to run on Theano. Now it runs on a fork of Theano called Asara. Uh, and it's, it's pretty clear. I think it's pretty clear what's going on here. But you know, again, we're having a code bath. So we're just looking at how these are written down. Um, this is MC. I always feel obliged to show this because, again, it's, it's so well cited in the astrophysics community. Um, they take a different tact um, where they're not thinking about their models in terms of DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. Um, they're thinking in terms of a uh, prior and a likelihood. I'm always just uh, 
shocked when I go to when I talk to astrophysicists because you know you write down you write down these little models in pi and C and they're like, well, why don't you just write down the joint density instead? And and the, they would prefer doing this. I, I prefer doing the other. Um, but but so there's the log likelihood. Um, so we if if you're sharp on like what normal uh, distributions, what the probability of a normal distribution is, that's the log probability of a normal. Um, and then we, we do some more work. We use uh, scipy.stats, st.multivariate normal to do some things. Um, but then we'll, we'll run a sampler. The sampler that they use is not very good. Um, and M uh, exoplanet is an attempt to sort of move uh, more astrophysicists into using gradient-based samplers. Uh, and again, I'd be happy to talk about the sampler that they use and what its uh, drawbacks might be. Um, so this was before, and in terms of the Bayesian workflow, uh, four or five years ago, each of these libraries tried to own the entire graph. So if you're missing one of these or if one of your libraries did not do one of these very well, um, for example, Stan in Python did not have very good uh, computation validation or visualizations. Uh, and so what happened was a few years ago, uh, we started this project RVs, which is also NumFocus supported. Um, and RVs tries to take away some of these nodes from the libraries, and any of these, all of these libraries work with RVs. So you can go and do your, uh, all this model work, anything inside the blue circle, you can run in the framework of your choice, pass it over to RVs, and then get the data back and, and keep working on this Bayesian workflow. Um, that was really successful. I think that really helped, uh, helped the Bayesian ecosystem. It, it helped people uh, centralize on a couple, you know, we all agree on which uh, algorithms we're using to compute our hat. Um, people are doing very active research on, uh, on how to like compute that better. Um, so this was really successful. And now in JAX, I think the way the ecosystem is going is splitting this out as well. So writing down your model uh, can be done in one framework, then fitting your model and doing the actual Bayesian computation can be done in another model. Um, and then RVs is still standing on the side and you know, doing what it does best. So what do I mean by this? through here. So here are three libraries, uh, Distracts, Distracts, NumPyro, and TensorFlow Probability. Um, so these are all their input port statements. Uh, and here's how to initialize a multivariate normal in each of the three libraries. Uh, so we've got, uh, there's a mu and a sigma. I think that both of them are just a, th a vector of length three. Um, NumPyro, uh, is a little bit funny here because you just use a normal distribution and you call it dot two event. Uh, the difference between batches and events is uh, if I didn't include this dot two event and I computed a the probability of uh, of some point using this normal distribution, I'd get three numbers back. But if I compute the probability of a multivariate normal at a set of three points, I would get one number back, right? Because multivariate normals uh, are, are distribution over perhaps three dimensional things. Um, whereas normals are just distributions over one dimensional things. So calling dot two event says, hey, don't, in don't interpret this mu and this sigma as three different normals and uh, interpret them as one single normal uh, that is multivariate. But now I can do cool jack tricks. Uh, so I can, I can, uh, I have these three distributions. I can draw some samples using, say, distracts. Uh, and then I can compute the log probability of them using any of the three, uh, any of the three distribution objects. Um, so I'm trading from one library to these others. Uh, and it turns out that uh, sampling normal distributions is such a standard task that uh, uh, if you draw the samples from any of the three libraries using the same JAX key, you'll actually get the uh, exact same samples, which is not behavior I would rely on, but it does happen. Is there any JAX in here yet? This, is, this all happens to be running on JAX. Um, so right now, yeah, so the question was, is there any JAX in here yet? All of this is, is running on JAX. Um, one thing about JAX is uh, the keys are stateful or stateless. Um, so you do have to pass, uh, this is the only sort of difference that you, then you might feel in a NumPy ecosystem. Um, and the other difference that you'd have, which I have not highlighted yet, is that you could call gradient on each of the log probabilities. But there's nothing else too special about it so far. But it's quote running in JAX almost incidentally in that incidentally each one was written on top of JAX. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so this is this is incidental that they are they're all using and so they all have the same arrays array libraries underpinning them. And that's that's important that they'll they know how to use their libraries. This would also actually play well on this page at least with uh, NumPy objects. So I could also be using SciPy multivariate normals here. I have a 
question. I've seen some libraries like LabJax that just focus on samplers. Do you see any space that if I want another sampler, I just take a LabJax sampler and then... Oh my god, I, I'm so happy. I did not, I did not invite him here and, uh, uh, to ask these questions. So yeah, um, so what, what can we do next? We can use Blackjacks. Um, this is a fantastic library um, that's, that has composable uh, pieces for MCMC. It doesn't define its own statistical distributions. It just focuses on sampling. Um, I really like the Blackjacks project. I, I encourage everyone to check it out. Um, it, it, it is batteries not included, so you do have to put together some things. Um, I copied this right out of the README. Um, so it is easy to put this together. Um, it's as easy as a copy paste. Um, and then you can call window adaptation. I'm passing in here a distracts log probability, and this is where I could not be using NumPy. Um, so it requires that it's JAX internally in BlackJax. They are using uh, uh, JAX specific machinery like uh, Gradient and VMAP, which vectorizes things. Um, so I do need this to be a, a, a JAX uh, function. Uh, and then I get then I get my states out, and it'll do a fine job sampling. Uh, another thing I could do is I could use TensorFlow probability. TensorFlow probability takes a different approach to building samplers. Um, it's, uh, you, you might think of it as an onion, so you start from the inside. Here's the no U-turn sampler. Um, and I pass, I'm passing the NumPy row log probability. I could pass any of these three. Um, and then outside of that, I put simple step size adaptation that does some tuning to make sure my sampler will be more efficient. And outside of that, I put sample chain that's going to go and run this MCMC sampler for some number of steps. Then outside of that, I put jax.jit that makes everything go fast. Um, if you're using jax, uh, often you'll write down your function and then outside everything you'll call jax.jit and then call your function uh, once it is jitted. Um, and that'll make everything go faster. Can you go back to the previous slide? Whoop. So here, Passing in an object written in a library that's written on top of JAX into some other library called BlackJAX, which offers samplers. Yes. And then in the next slide, you are taking a, a thing that's written in JAX as per the input statement, presumably? Uh, no, this, this numpyro is written in numpyro, which is written on JAX. Okay. So, so this is another log prob written on JAX. So another object written. <laughs> Yep. Like I'm just wondering if there is a hierarchy or if you can, I mean, not. So, so, so the thing, the, this, this object here can be any function written in JAX that re returns a log probability. Okay. That's right. And it, this one just happens to be from NumPyRo, but you could take, you could take the NumPyRo one and then add JAX.1s of eight to it. Um, and then you get some new number and that would also be a valid, may, might be a valid log probability. Um, so this, this can be any function that computes log probability of points. Um, and you just have to have a valid point to start it off on. Um, so that's this current state mu. Okay. So, so if you have a function that eats mu and returns log probabilities and it's written in JAX, that'll work here, that'll work in black JAX, and that'll work in NumPyRo. Okay. I have a better question later. I don't yeah. Know. <laughs> yeah. Um, there and yeah, and so the the last one is NumPyRo, and just the way that NumPyRo is defined is organized. So I'm passing in this log probability. It turns out NumPyRo cares about uh, potential functions, not log probabilities. Uh, potential functions are just negative the log probability, so I do have to put that little negative sign there. Um, but then I can put that together into an MCMC kernel um, and call dot run. Um, the reason I don't use JIT on this or on Blackjack is because they're built into the libraries. Um, so the libraries themselves just called um, JIT. Um, TensorFlow probability doesn't do that for technical reasons. What, yeah. What is that, JIT? Uh, JIT is what makes JAX go fast. <laughs> it's, it's weird that there's a button that says, would you like this to go fast, and it's like not automatically pressed. Um, your, your functions, there's, there are certain like if statements sometimes can't be used inside of JIT. Um, so, it, so it is doing a compilation step, and sometimes your compiler will break, um, but it does make it significantly faster. Uh, so JIT is idempotent, which is pleasant. Um, so I could JIT this, and it would it wouldn't do anything, but um, it wouldn't it wouldn't hurt, but it wouldn't help. Yeah. Do you have like a speed comparison between a classic span model and calling that via Python? 
Uh, it, benchmarks for Bayesian models are really hard. Um, I would expect uh, I would expect that they are comparable because they are running comparable um, algorithms. Uh, so if the the question is how how does Stan or or one of these samplers calling into Jax how do they compare in terms of speed? Um, there's a lot of parallelization work done for Stan, um, but you can scale this up to say like a doing a thousand independent runs at the same time on a GPU, and that takes about the same amount of time as doing one run, um, and that's that's pretty powerful um, to, the, to the point where we don't really have diagnostics for handling a thousand chains. Um, there's some interesting papers written this year um, on, on doing that, but but yeah. So I think in terms of racing for one chain, I, uh, I would expect that they're similar, or even the stand might be somewhat faster for some models, and I think Jax would be faster for some models. If you're doing really like, really big matrix multiplies. Um, I don't know. Jax, uh, Jax might help with their GPUs. I guess uh, just sort of like a secondary question is that if it is to like develop things like Jax over like Stan, really about like scale or like just keeping code bases also similar, like, because like a lot of Bayesian or machine learning models are you know like Python and you know really similar. Like, yeah. So, so is the question about like yeah, like I guess what's the motivation for even developing these secondary li libraries if yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So, so why why does anyone else bother if uh, if Stan is great? Um, yeah, that's a that's a great question. So it is useful um, to use Python if if you're in Python. Um, Stan is tough to install, um, and and I mean like as as with all open source, sometimes you have an itch and you would have taken different uh, design considerations. Um, you know, certainly. Uh, uh, Certainly, if you happen to work at a company that has a lot of models already written in Jax, and you wanted to introduce some sort of Bayesian uh, flavor to things, uh, it would be easier if you had some Jax samplers. Okay. Uh, three, three minutes. Perfect. And I think uh, I think I'm just about done as well. Yeah. So the the last sampler I wanted to show is PyMC. Um, this is only on version four, um, recently released. Um, so this is uh, I'm rewriting the model here as uh, just passing this mu and this uh, sigma. Um, and it has built in this uh, sampling Jax module. And so you can sample using NumPyRo, sample a PyMC model using NumPyRo. You can also sample a PyMC model using BlackJax. In both these cases, you'll get back um, Jax objects. Um, or you can get the log probability right from your model, and then you can go and do weird stuff to that log probability. So you can go and add more numbers or um, do like some sort of uh, wild simulation to it from there. Um, so you can you can go from PyMC to Jax. You can't, as far as I've done so far, you can't go from Jax back into PyMC, uh, which is a little bit too bad. Um, and the last thing, which I'm not going to focus on too much, is like once you have this uh, Jaxified log probability from PyMC or something from Distrax or something from uh, whichever library you have, you can go and use the rest of the Jax ecosystem as well. This is um, Optax, which is just an optimization library. Um, and so you can go and use Atom and uh, optimize the log probability. And this is just finding this maximum a posteriori estimate, um, which people often care about doing. Um, this will work just fine. Oops. Yeah. So we have two minutes for questions. <laughs> two more minutes for questions. Great. And yeah, and I'll just say these are these are these integration paths that I was talking about earlier that can go terribly wrong. And this is just three random ones running around. Um, so it's just a, a pretty thing to watch if, uh, if we didn't have questions. So you all had great questions this whole time. I see a possible thinking about it. No. Darn it. <laughs> what, what would it look like for something to go terribly wrong in one of these models? Oh, it'd just take off. Um, it would, so like if, if here it would be going to the really dense part of infinity. No, it would, it would it, yeah, it'd shoot off to infinity. The, I think the, the Bounds on this are like five or something, and it would be at like forty thousand after one step. Yeah. Yeah, so you showed like a lot of software, and like I know you talked about IMC. Is there like a place you recommend like starting? Um, yeah, I mean, I I still like starting with PyMC. I, I'm, I'll share also the the collab that that uh, runs all this, and so like also you might just if any of that code struck you as like oh that's pleasant that looks fun. Um, you might try that as well. Anything else or else I'll be around in hallways um, and, and always happy to chat about this stuff. Okay, well. 
Um, can you tell us who wrote Jax and what role in the ecosystem Jax was put this together? Yeah, so Jax, uh, Jax is a Google project, um, and I am, I am, I, I do work for Google, um, so I'm trying to sell it to you for the price of free. Um, but it, the, the same people who wrote Autograd, which is an older library, it wrote Jax. Um, so it feels very similar to Autograd if you've ever used that. Um, I find both of them very pleasant. They're both um, sort of functional libraries, so they transform functions into other functions. Um, so if, if people are into functional programming, they'll, they'll enjoy Jax. Um, but Matt, I, you know, I think like Matt Johnson, Dougal McLaren are, are uh, some, gosh, I'm on video and I'm, my, now my colleagues are going to be upset that I didn't acknowledge them by name. Um, there's a big team that's uh, working on it. Yeah. Something of a niche question. I was on Autograd maybe about five or six years ago, and I was looking at Jack at the time, and they said, "Sorry, we don't support Windows machines." So, <laughs> um, has that you know resolved over the last few years, or are there plans? I think Jax does work on Windows now. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Wild. <laughs> While I'd asking about the Google product supporting Windows at Microsoft, uh, <laughs> but so I don't know the, the the real answer to that question. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure there are issues on GitHub. Let's have another round of applause.